Good morning. This is Meg Riley in sunny Minneapolis, where it is above freezing today. It's really exciting for us here. We are just like having picnics. It's 35 or something. Anyway, <laughs> good morning. You've uh, come in for another episode of The View, and I'm very excited to say we're going to be talking about matters of faith development and religious education today. Aisha Hauser, how are you? Good morning. I'm Aisha Hauser and I'm in Seattle and it is sunny um, and it's been in the so I used to live in North Dakota. So when it hit 35, everyone was in shorts, like especially in March. So I totally get that. But now I'm in Seattle and when it hits 40, we're all in down jackets. So I don't know what that is. But yeah, it's sunny here today and it's uh, winter, which in Seattle is not the same. It's like it's like a Minnesota spring here, our winter. <laughs> Christina, how are you? Hey everybody, I'm good. It's Christina Rivera. I'm coming to you from Charlottesville, Virginia, where um, not local schools to here, but my local schools for my son's uh, area where we live had our first uh, inclement weather day uh, because we've got freezing rain and some snow and unsafe roads. So um, I'm glad to be here and safe and snug inside. Is it really unsafe or when I lived in DC, yeah, if they it thought it might be unsafe, they would close everything. No, our roads were really slick. We oh, actually yeah. ended up not even going home um, last night because Ooh. we wouldn't have been able to get back over the mountain. And my kids had uh, midterms today so that they could. Wow. Move. Yeah. Mountains will do that, won't they? I know. I've just decided to spring for snow tires because we had our first ice and even though I have this car with all wheel drive, I was sliding around the road and I thought, you know, snow tires are a good idea. So, and why not spend more money? I mean, it's just fun to spend money on things like snow tires, right? I'm privileged to have it. Anyway, we have Jessica, you want to tell us what you're up to today? I am on Twitter, hashtag The View. I'm on Facebook, fielding your questions and comments and passing them along to our hosts and guests today. And I'm also on the West Coast and enjoying this uh, weather out here today. Not too bad, you know, all things considered. Not, not too bad in Minnesota is like what you say if you won the lottery and someone asks you how you're doing. You go, not too bad. And like if you just got hit by a car and you're lying in the road and someone says, how are you? You go, not too good. That's kind of the emotional range here. You know, it's <laughs> anyway, so not too bad. Whoa, that's amazing, Jessica. That's great. So we have two special guests today, uh, religious educators from around the country. We have Annie Scott, who's out in Golden, Colorado. Hello, Annie. And Sheila Shu, who is in Rochester, New York. And we are doing this show because the fall conference of the Liberal Religious Educators Association just happened. Did I get that right? It didn't change names. Okay, the acronym still means that because I was blowing it with a different acronym a few weeks ago. Um, and Annie, you kind of had a do-over this year. We had you on last year after a pretty rough conference around this time of year. And I'd love to hear you talk about, because we need positive role models of people who don't leave, who actually say, oh, I made a mistake. I can deal with that, actually. So what happened? Yeah. Well, it's nice to be back after a fall conference with a very different feel and much, much, much learning. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, the theme of our, of our conference this year was changing narratives. And part of what was sort of interesting for me to reflect for myself was over the course of the year, how my narrative of last fall's conference changed. And, uh, you know, the pain of it hasn't changed. The pain of, of being hurtful to people of color and other marginalized people um, is still part of the story and central to it. And for me personally, I, I think forever, for the rest of my life, it will uh, be a part of my kind of awakening story that I just learned so much from the experience there and then in the in 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 the subsequent year. Um, you know, the the board this year after fall conference, uh, we read, um, uh, of course, I'm blanking, Salsa Soul, Soul and Spirit by uh, Juana Bordas. And one of the differences for us this year was that we really tried to come into it with a really different sense of we. 
what does we mean and a, a sense of what does it mean to to center people of color? What does it mean to follow people of color? Um, and uh, Linnea Nelson, our, our newer vice president on the board, brought us uh, Julica Germán de Mela Fuente, who is um, a community minister and um, has been working as staff person on the change, the Commission on, on Institutional Change. And she, she was part of, of doing some planning with us and really, really brought profound insights for us that in some ways, those of us, at least who were white, had to just kind of go, okay, you know, we're going to follow you, um, which wasn't always comfortable, but, but the result was, you know, profoundly uh, richer, deeper, better for, for everyone, I think. You know, when when Asha was uh, Asha was referencing that we were both out in Colorado, a few California, sorry, a few weeks ago at the at the Commission on Institutional Change gathering, and um, Leslie Takahashi talked about how if we make it make our make our experiences inclusive to those most marginalized, it's more welcoming to everyone, and. You know that definitely was part of the experience this year. That that Julika, who was our our beginning evening speaker, um, said, "I, you know," she said, "I know I'm the keynote, and let's do it. Let's unkeynote it." And really showed us, led us how to uh, introduce people through relationship, through connections, rather than the kind of white supremacist list of why you should listen to this person because they have this degree or this or that or the other thing. And so that we, we, we did that over the whole conference, which was a real challenge to many of us, but it just made a tremendous difference in the whole feel of the conference. And, and now I can't remember what your question was, Meg. <laughs> did, did I answer it? Am I? Yes, you did. You answer? answered it. And I'd love to hear from the other folks who were there, how, how it felt different to you. So um, I really appreciated that this year we had um, kind of like General Assembly, uh, a, the wisdom of our colleagues was in, there were invitations to present workshops. And so there was several workshops to choose from. There was a Renaissance module during fall conference on youth ministry. Um, Sheila and I co-led administrative families ministry to families of color. And so I do want to talk about that at some point in the show, because I thought it was uh, an important topic. But in general, it was, um, you know, what, it, what was inspiring to me was it was a learning. It wasn't just that there was what happened last year and then it was like, well, we'll just make sure to placate every, whoever we, we need to placate for this year. It was, no, we're going to do it differently. And, and I loved it. I mean, I was definitely um, the odyssey uh, which is usually done by someone who's retired and was actually uh, Dr. Takia Amin from Blue, Black Lives of UU, and it, I loved it. Um, now, I did hear from people they missed having an odyssey, and I said, well, that's something you can do in a local Lareda chapter. I mean, a lot of the times I really have no connection to the person who's speaking, but if it's somebody from my chapter who I've known, I mean, maybe that could be re-envisioned um, because I loved it. So uh, I appreciate what happened this year. Um, and how it happened is, is even more um, was inspiring to me. Yeah, I, 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 I really, you know, we, we took really seriously the feedback we got last year. We read and reread and reread evaluations throughout the year so that it would guide us. And one of the things that you point to, Asia, is learning from our peers that at last year's fall conference, you know, when we dismissed uh, the, 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 the hired speakers and basically uh, were guided by uh, religious educators of color for the most part, completely redesigned the rest of the conference. It was an experience in how much religious educators have to offer each other. And so taking that learning into this um, was, I thought, really extraordinary too. And I just want to say how much I loved the Blue Odyssey and, and Takia. She was an extraordinary speaker and 
just having she and Leslie Mack there from Blue so that people could meet them, had access to them, saw them in person. You know, I, I just, I thought that was really important too. And I think that, I think that Takia's address to us has all sorts of ramifications that are gonna be far reaching. I agree with all of that. And and one of the things that, that I loved about it was the intentionality behind it. So it was very intentional and it wasn't just a changed Falcon, it was a changed Lareda. Um, that it, it wasn't, it, it didn't seem to me at least that the Lareda exec team and the planning team were just looking to change Falcon. They were looking to change the culture of Lareda itself as an organization of uh, religious educators. Um, because I think as Asia said, it's not, it's not just about you know, placating or, or seeming, feeling like you need to placate a certain group. It's really about making cultural and systemic shifts in our organizations as we are able to recognize white supremacy. And that's what I really liked. Um, and, and I'd love it if you could talk a little bit more about that process, Annie, because I, I think it's really important to model for, for you know, other religious um, professional organizations and our association. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to ask the three of you to reflect on how it felt, uh, how it seemed reflected in the culture rather than just the kind of surface. So let me answer and then I'll ask, I'll kind of but I'd turn love to hear from Sheila first, if that's okay, and then go to- Good, yeah, I would love that. Great. Yeah, Thank something you. that Aisha said to me last year um, was that we can't be afraid to lead. And uh, this conference was an example of us really testing the waters about leading collaboratively and what does that mean? I think if we don't take the opportunity to try different models, we won't feel our way through to how Unitarian Universalism can look in terms of multiculturalism. So if we don't take the lead and say, we're gonna try this and we're really gonna try to be intentional against that white, white supremacy cultural norms and all of that, then we won't, we won't be able to really embrace what it, what it could be. So for me, that was the biggest thing was about being willing to, after the mistake, um, being willing to step forward and say, so um, how do we grow through this? And for me, it was so refreshing because it, it represented a model kind of congregation or community in terms of people, like we espouse these values of learning and growing together through pain, but to actually see it happen, <laughs> you know, like this is how you use religiously learn it's in the doing. So that, that, those would be my thoughts about it. So Sheila, can you give some examples of when it, when it felt, you know, kind of lived or, yeah. Absolutely. Like for me, I was on the worship planning team and that whole process in itself was completely balanced. Nobody had an agenda. It didn't come together till way late in the process. Nobody freaked out about it. We all just sat with, oh, let's sit with a story. What about this story? Let's sit together with this and figure out how does this feel? Is this answering the needs of our Lareda community? You know, like it was a very much like a, an in-depth process of sitting together with it and nobody had the answer. And that to me, that kind of discomfort of not knowing is what I think Julica was talking about where she's saying, we don't know what we don't know. I mean, in so many ways, and we won't know what we don't know. I mean, like there's a lot we don't know yet about how this can actually look. So that planning process for me was just one example. And I think another example would be like the workshop that I led for family UU Circle. There, I think we had 45 people in that room and we had a, such a great time. And it was, it was not just that it was a learning about how to have families have a different culture. It was that process of people participating it in, in ways that were collaborative. So it, it's expressing kind of that restorative process in the learning. So those would be two examples that for me just felt like, wow, um, this is how it's, it, this is how the new, something we don't know yet actually feels when it comes alive, you know? 
So okay. having, having experienced that, I'm really curious. I'm like, yes, this is, you know, um, Adrian Marie Brown talks about fractals and how you want to replicate the fractals. So how, how do you think this could, so you, you got, had this experience, then you went back to your congregations, where if they are most, like most congregations, this is not what's happening. <laughs> so how, how does this spread? And maybe I'm asking this too soon, but I'm like, yes. And I, I also want to just reflect that every single one of you use the word learning. That's why I love religious educators, because you actually are about learning. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so cool because clearly a learning environment is what we all need so much. So I'm, I'm curious if you had thoughts. I mean, I know that General Assembly, for instance, they're talking about doing it really differently. What, you know, how, I mean, lead, lead, <laughs> lead, I say. What, how do you think this could move out? I'll just say that for me, it's about making room. That's purely how it is. It's about making room for other, other ways of being there. Like I did a, we did a training, we did a workshop this weekend at my church and there were actually a few um, white men, older white men who came up after and said, we have things really backwards. We have intellect and worship. It shouldn't be there. We should have heart-based felt sense stuff in worship. And so I feel like the system is changing. So that workshop was led by four women and women of color also. So like when you experience something different, then the rest of it shifts out. So you have a deeper understanding of how it might look different in other areas of the church. Um, that's, that's my learning from it is when you try a different model and you make room for other identities to have power, it will, people naturally go, oh, oh, right. That feels actually better. I mean, for me, so um, when it, when that kind of collaboration and the results of <clears throat> collaboration is experienced to, to, to Sheila's point, um, then, then there's, I hope, modeling for what you can take home. So what I, when I do leadership workshops or when I talk to folks about collaborative leadership, I say, you know what? This isn't about, you, you don't have to be the CEO to lead, right? So we manage as religious educators, a slew of volunteers each week, um, all the time, right? And so how do you work with the volunteers? How, how do you, you can, oh, you, there is always an opportunity to be collaborative and to model that because people are watching us all the time. And so um, what I just co-led an owl training um, this past weekend. And that was one of the things we kept saying when they would say, well, what if, how do we do this? How do we do that? And I said, hey, you can only control, you can't control how people respond to you. You can only model, you're always modeling. And so that's one of the things that was um, inspiring Annie to me um, about <clears throat> how this worked is you were, even last year, it's just, you were modeling oh, okay, this was something that, that happened and here's how we're responding and here's what we're doing, what we did with the learning. And so it's, it's modeling that's continuing so we can within our sphere um, be, be who you wanna be and be the change you wanna see. So I think that's, that's what I would say. And I definitely want to get to ministering to families with uh, of color when when we get when we I don't want to lose that because um, that's super alive for me right now. So I literally got an email yesterday from a mom in a, a multi ethnic family who said, "Can we start a support group for families of color?" And I'm like, "Yes!" And one of my favorite people is doing it really well in Rochester. So yes, I will get her map and we will make it happen. So I think we're there. <laughs> <laughs> why, don't, why don't you talk more since you're starting to talk about it? We can, you know, we can circle around with, with the, but obviously this is exciting. Well, I think the, to one of them, so we did, uh, Jessica York and Jermaine, Jermaine Kripe and I did the workshop at General Assembly, Ministering to Families of Color. And then when I was asked to present it here at Lareda, Jermaine and Jessica weren't available. So I asked Sheila, who I know is doing phenomenal work in Rochester. And what was really helpful was to hear how, uh, you sh and I'm, I don't want to speak for you because I'd love for you to tell the story of um, in addition to planning what making the space for what families need 
it's also how you are as the leader, as a religious educator, are going to show up um, for families as an ally. So Sheila, I would love for you to tell a story if you're comfortable in a, never, in, in a way of how you showed up as an ally, because when other folks with my, you know, with, with target identities, um, see that white people are going to be allies in the moment and substantively, then I think they're like, oh, okay, I can be in this space. So I think the um, situation you're referring to, Asia, is um, I had a I was offering a one off for families on uh, the mental health care of their children. And I had a person, uh, a, da a dad of color, talk about his concerns for his daughter, not for any other reason other than she was a person of color. And so um, someone else in the group, uh, a white woman sitting next to him had said something that wasn't very helpful because she was suggesting that the way that he could strengthen her identity was to take her to marches and do social action stuff. And I basically had said, you know, that's not helpful. And could I talk with him after? Um, and that whole conversation ended up getting other families together and working with them about what are the actual, it, it helped to open my eyes up to the identity development that we co-create in community life and how I needed to take a better responsibility to listen to our families of color, especially parents who have specific needs that they have for their kids. Um, so I, I didn't realize till after the workshop, Asia, of all the things that actually, you know, we had talked about, like as a white DRE that you could do um, and trying to make it clear for other white non-Hispanic DREs that the way that the culture is set up, you know, I need to take at least eight steps to maybe there two. And those steps are mostly not things that anyone else will see. Um, so I hope that's helpful. I, I don't, um, for me, it was a matter of really listening to parents say, we need a strategic plan. We need to understand that the system will hold itself accountable for this. And we don't have to continue to advocate. We need something else that the structure will help, um, be set for us so that we feel like our kids are having their needs met and our family's needs then are met. Um, through that. So um, that was something I really took away from that is the, the issue of trust, I think, is under, it, it's not given enough attention in terms of the white supremacy norms that are part of the community. Um, that trust with families of color demands that white non-Hispanic DREs make um, additional effort and internal work as well to be able to have even a, a deeper than surface relationship to families of color. Andy, what did you think? You were at the workshop, I'm curious. I, I, it was actually my second time at, your, at that workshop of yours. And, you know, I loved it. Um, I loved the story, Sheila, that you told today and at the, at the workshop. Um, you know, I came home inspired to do something to 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 um, reach out to uh, families with of color or with children of color. I mean, you know, to kind of do that scary initial meeting conversation about um, how can we serve you better? What are your needs? Um, so so it, let me answer let me answer Meg's question about how do we bring that home? Because I I. I'm going to answer it. I mean, I'm not as quite as pragmatically as as Asia, you and Sheila are in terms of some actual things to do. But for me, it's that ongoing work of humility and discomfort. Um, I was talking to Christina a day or two ago and talked about some of the hard work. And she said, yeah, I think if your stomach's not in a knot, you're not doing it. <laughs> Which, of course, uh, um, 
you know, one of my really big learnings at this fall conference was not within the conference, but with, with the board that um, we knew that we wanted to do the Monday meeting differently, which is a member meeting. And um, we knew we didn't, we didn't have to do any, any uh, official business, but we wanted the whole experience to be different, not a bunch of reports, not yada, yada, blah, 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 that the, the majority, you know, 99% don't care about anyway. And, and we hadn't planned it before the conference. And so we kept trying to meet and plan it and, and uh, without really realizing it as the president, I felt like, oh my God, this is really my responsibility. And the actual planning of it happened when I had to be someplace else. And um, then it turned out I, I didn't, the, so the, the rest of the board planned Monday and I turns out did not trust them. You know, it, I mean, that's what it came down to is I, the last minute I saw their notes and it was like, oh my God, there's, there's not, there's all these pieces. Oh. And, you know, got into my own, my own uh, perfectionism and sense of individualism. Oh, this is my responsibility. And um, I mean, I didn't think I don't trust them, but when, when we met about it Monday morning to go over what had happened and I uh, uh, had white supremacy rising up in me, um, and the board called me on it. It took three of them to, to say, wait a minute, you, you're not trusting. What we did was good work. This is going to be good. And it was just excruciating for me and has been in, in the week and a half since. But and that will come that will be one of my most important learnings about this is is that stuff living in me. And, you know, I was tired. And when I'm tired, all that sort of the deepest enculturation takes place. So, so that's to say, Meg, that I think that, I, I think that one of the most important things that we can do is keep doing our own work. And that takes humility and it takes living with a knot in the stomach and not going the place, you know, or noticing when we go to the places that we've been trained to go. Um, and, you know, I've been pretty uncomfortable since fall conference and it's about that I would prefer to be perfect. <laughs> I'd, I'd prefer to be comfortable or something. And, and you know, it's not, it's not what my faith calls me to do. It's not what the people that I love and admire and who are in relationships of accountability. Um, so that, that's my answer to that question. Annie Scott, I love you. What a beautiful, what a beautiful truth telling. I mean, who, I can totally relate to that. Like, well, but wait, but what about me? I mean, you know, and to just own that and to sit in the discomfort of acknowledging what it is, what, that's just beautiful leadership. Thank you. That's, that just was really beautiful. I mean, I just, white people, look, <laughs> look, it can be done. <laughs> I'm gonna pull that out. And you too can be this uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> what, Jessica? You're gonna pull it out? I'm gonna pull that out. Make a video and just post that. <laughs> I just feel like that is just exactly what we who are white need to do: is just be real like that. You know, like, oh, actually, right. I've been trained not to trust you, and yeah, I only trust my ego. It turns out, and yeah, yeah, just all of that, and even the. I mean, you laugh, but I want to be perfect. Well, yeah, that's way yeah. supremacy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we know it's and ridiculous, but there it is, alive and yeah. sick in our heads anyway. So. You know, it's, and, and it's that stuff about that Robin D'Angelo talks about, about building resilience, right? That we can only build resilience by, you know, being in the fire, being in the pain and discomfort of, of the kind of change and transformation we're trying to do. So... I'm committed to building resilience. It's just not very fun. <laughs> and I like me some fun. <laughs> but we're laughing now. Come on. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> well, I, I think that's so important. And it's so important to, you know, to note that. So, you know, Falcon, there, there were still moments like, you know, it wasn't perfect. And, and we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for people to be all in. You know, that's, that's what the, our faith is about, is about people being all in. Um, 
and caring about each other when it when it goes wrong, right? And and not caring about themselves as much <laughs> when it goes wrong. Like, you know, but caring about the person who's been injured <laughs> a little bit more um, than than ourselves. And and so, you know, even at this fall con, there were still, you know, moments where we're like, oh, that didn't go so well. And, you know, what do we need to do in the future to to, you know, see if we can, you know, prevent that? Or, but but it was different um, because it felt like everybody was all in. Like folks were just there and, and, you know, I, uh, Meg, you said a little bit about general assembly. Um, so, you know, this past general assembly attendance was liked and um, there's a lot of reasons behind that. People have a lot of different um, ideas about what, you know, why that can be location funds, you know, um, but a lot of folks are saying, you know, we think also people are turned off by, um, the focus on racial justice and um, and that may be true, but what also felt true was the folks who were there were all in like and they they were willing to really look at the way our theology and how we do faith formation as it speaks to our theology calls us to this um, and to that discomfort, you know like, that's that's <laughs> that's where we got to be, and and if we're in that discomfort together, really together, then then you know I tell people it's getting to that discomfort and and then holding there and holding each other there, um, because you know nobody nobody's going to want to stay there for you know unknown amounts of time, and yet that's what it's going to take. So if you have somebody else who's there with you and who cares about you that's going to make a difference. That's our theology of love, right? So um, I, I'm really grateful to you, Annie, for, for, uh, for lifting up that, you know, even, even in it, even as we're trying to do it, it still can get messy and, and yucky. Just lift up the love notes coming in from viewers today. Uh, deep appreciation from uh, let's see, Charles and Ndidi and Phil and just people really lifting up, I think, hunger for this kind of leadership. And, and I'll just say, as I say many times, that I feel like religious educators have always been the cutting edge of leadership around oppression, anti-racism, white supremacy, not just the teaching last year, two of the architects of which are here with us each week, but... but um, you know, Bill Jones in the mid eighties came and talked about systemic racism to religious educators. It's the first time I ever thought racism was anything besides Archie Bunker, you know, like, I mean, I, I think that um, always it's, it's, it's been religious educators taking us. So I love the, um, I, I love the, the grassroots organizing that you're doing, I think to, um, you know, take over the movement. I think it's a good thing for all of us. So, and Ty, yeah. Ty also writes in, yeah. I, I think until Falcon, I didn't quite understand as fully as I did. I think Christina, you were at our table when we were talking about perfectionism in the blue workshop, that my capacity to give that up actually is supporting my colleagues of color. Like I did not make the total connection that my capacity to not live in that place of perfection makes it a better place for any of professionals of color to exist in that space. And so it wasn't until fall con and, and since that I've actually thought about that. Um, even if I'm worried about my own job, consider how that will be for my colleagues of color. If, if I don't model that, you know, I'm not going to be um, pushed aside or total, you know, marginalized because I make a mistake. Like I need to stay in it to model that so that other people can show up as they want to show up. And I think that's the benefit that Loretta has right now is that we are tight in terms of our collegial accountability to each other. And that's what will make it different in the future. I think that's where we're building from. Yeah, and, and I remember that that conversation that we had and, and what I was what I was saying was, you know, the risks that our white colleagues take in 
um, not capitulating to perfectionism, um, you know, if you think it's hard for you, it's impossible for us. You know, if it's hard for our white colleagues to achieve perfection, it is absolutely impossible for us. And so when our white colleagues capitulate to that perfectionism, it, it, just, makes, it just makes it impossible for us um, to succeed, well, not to succeed, but to, um, to be thought you know, um, worthy, or to be thought to be um, qualified, you know, to, to be thought of all of those things. Um, and, and so we really do need you know, our, our white colleagues to as hard it as it is to push back on that um, and say, no, you know, this is a hallmark of white supremacy culture and, you know, and say those things because every time you all say that is a time that we don't have to um, and that we get closer to being, um, to being free. And the reason for that, I think, is that we haven't built restorative process within our communities to hold all of that. And so without restorative process and restorative practice, we have the wider systems, punitive system of dealing with conflict, just infecting it and, and basically saying you can't be at the table if you're not going to be perfect. So. Right. And, and I don't, I, I, one trail I don't want to lose is Sheila, what you had said earlier about recognizing need and, and um, and so, you know, this was talking about a little bit about our need of, uh, from our colleagues, but the need that you also were articulating was a need, you know, from our families um, who, families of color, but also oftentimes um, because of transracial adoption are mixed and bicultural families. And um, so one of the things I definitely want to highlight is after last year's fall con, there was a Renaissance module that Asia led with. Oh my gosh, Asia, I'm going to lose. Uh, Reverend mm -hmm. Samaya Oakley from Canada. Thank you. <laughs> uh, who was fabulous? Um, led, and there was a for us a large cohort of um, religious educators of color who were at that Renaissance module, and we actually took our final project from that Renaissance module out of the Renaissance module and worked on it for a year um, and got funding for it. But like many other things that religious professionals of color are try to try to do outside of you know compensated hours, um, we just couldn't. We we had we had a package, and we were ready to go. We just couldn't get um, you know critical mass around getting it off the ground. And um, it is a it's a retreat for um, I was going to say biracial, but multiracial families. Um, and um, the FOSS Collaborative heard about that and helped us pick it up. And it's now gonna be offered at Berry Beach next year. Um, so it'll be July 20th through the 27th. It's called The Well. Um, it is specifically designed for multiracial families. Um, we specifically had, you know, are working towards workshops for um, you know, uh, white parents of um, biracial or, or um, kids and, you know, just for the entire family to be able to experience what it feels like to be affirmed um, for that. And um, so, you know, I definitely want people to know that and to start kind of saving the date on that because um, I know Fairy Beach is hard to get to for a lot of different reasons. I know I'm thinking Fairy Beach. Huh. I know it, it was an interesting, um, <laughs> it's an interesting thing, but we're going with it. And um, but we want people to, to start getting it on their radar so that we can start figuring out the ways to get families there. So, and the way that happened was an awesome example of collaboration. It was um, what happens in. Uh, Renaissance module opportunities is you have 15 hours of learning and then there's a project that you envision. Now, you know, the fact that you all took that and, and it um, kept it going is incredibly inspiring. I don't want to lose that. Um, Monday morning, we found out that Ted Cruz's people were at the Houston Hotel and uh, it, Ty Razinde and I'm going to forget her name. The, there was a few religious educators. That, Ina Defoe. 
Tina Defoe uh, organized a die-in and they said, okay, this was part of, um, cause I was doing the summary speech and, and uh, Annie, you know, even I, I will say Annie, I was with you. I was like, oh, so does that mean I'm not doing my speech anymore? I mean, I had worked on it already, darn it. I need to talk. <laughs> um, and it was great. And we just took signs. And then there were people who said, I don't want to get arrested. So I'm staying here. We needed people to watch purses. So it was great. Um, I will say in full disclosure, I thought there was slim to no chance of us getting arrested because I don't want to get arrested either. So, but I did it. I followed Jessica York was in front of me and it was, it was powerful. And then we, and then as soon as uh, the very kind and sweet hotel manager asked us to leave, we did, we got up sang our way out and it was quite beautiful, but it was an extraordinary, I think, bonding moment. Um, so I appreciate everyone who organized it and just said, we're doing this. And then we walked out and did it. And it was, it was, um, it was powerful. Yeah, Liz Brewer Martin wrote, I think the space made for the die-in exemplified the flexibility around programming and it was awesome. So yeah, that was really fun to see come across social media, I have to say right about then. That was exciting. Oh, wait, and Ty is naming a couple other people, Catherine Childs and Sam Wilson. So thanks to everybody who organized that. Yeah, that's great. Oh, so back to families of color. Um, so there's going to be a workshop in this, uh, a gathering, a camp, kind of, is that what we're talking about? A retreat. A retreat. Okay. Um, for people who can't go to that, what do you, um, Sheila and Asia, in this workshop, do you have practical things that you encourage people to do back home? I mean, I'm just thinking I'm, I'm a little part-time person out there in a church. I'm going to gather people with multiracial families and people of color, but uh, other things? Well, one of the things I'm doing this weekend at two different places in both Bellevue and Seattle is um, a workshop on how to talk to your children about race. But I really, I don't start there. I start with, it's kind of like we say in our whole lives, if you don't teach your children about sex, someone else will. If you do not have explicit conversations with your children about racial injustice and what happens in this country, um, they will simply be absorbing the media messages that are racist and white supremacist uh, in nature. So um, that's one of the things I'm doing this weekend. And it was at, as a result of helping plan that workshop that one of the parents in my congregation who is in a multi-ethnic family said, I'd really like to have a families of color group or have something. And so for me, and we already have a POC only group, but it is not, and it is for, it's not the same, um, it's not it's it's only a poc group and it is multi-age I mean, we've had youth come which has been great however um i want to create a program that is for families who are mixed who have, i mean i'm part of a multi-racial multi-ethnic family um and sheila i would love to hear what you're already doing in rochester because i'm genuinely inspired by you and your work well we have um we have a soul matters for people of color adults um and some of our uh, our, uh, well, our young adults would be welcome to that. Um, we do uh, families of color, um, mostly just casual. So maybe once a month or every six weeks or so, um, we have a gathering of some kind. Last time we had like an after church soup and go to the pumpkin farm together. We've done just a potluck. We've done um, a meetup uh, like at my house, just an outdoor bonfire, um, just so that families have a sense of who, because our community is large, have a sense to build um, relationship with other families of color just for that very reason. And no pressure to volunteer to do anything or it's just purely relationship building. Um, and um, I guess that's, that's the, the first step um, we also, I hired one of our young adults of color to be at the membership table every Sunday so that when families do come in, they have somebody there that can speak to them and, and have that kind of welcome that I would like for our families of color to have. Um, and that seems to have been, for me, just a, like a huge uh, step in terms of just being present in that different way to the families. Um, so I don't really know what's next on our horizon. Uh, <laughs> we're working a lot with, I crossed over into adult ed to, to help support a strategic plan for working on restorative practice as well as uh, anti-racism. So I'm now kind of 
I tried to work on some on that because it, it actually has come up through RE, through our parenting program. So the other piece we have is this parenting, um, a spiritual practice. And some of our parents of color are in there, um, but that model of using um, communication and mindfulness practice and trying to create different norms in your family system apart from those cultural norms of white supremacy. What do so, you mean by restorative practices? So restorative practices, there's like a, a wide continuum of what restorative practice includes. It can include anything from um, a 10 minute, uh, a 10 second uh, empathy with yourself and compassion to a chaplain in, um, interaction with someone to a soul matters um, circle for me or to like if you're going to do like a healing circle like that was fall con that was an example of a restorative process so um, restorative practices are um, ways of being in relationship that are definitely more um, equitable and foster kind of collaboration consensus um, that everyone's experience is valued in the system, that there's um, input into how, the, the most important part for me in terms of the anti-racist work is that when covenant is broken through a microaggression or some other means, that there is another system that the church will use to repair that. And that's not just, I'm sorry, that's I'm sorry and what do you need, right? Like Aisha, you were saying in your workshop, it's the second half of that. I'm sorry, it's not about my needs at that point. It is about like what Christina said, what do you need so that the system can move forward in covenant? So restorative process involves all of those ways that we interact, that we restore wholeness of, of people's humanity. Um, that's why I, I'm particularly committed to those things running together and not separate. Um, and because is the congregation covenanted to use restorative practices? I mean, I'm, how does this work in a congregational culture? To, we have, to... yeah, so we have, you have, would have it in pockets now, right? You have it in soul matter circles and you have it in kids, joys and sorrow circles. So there's all, there's already pockets of restorative process going on. We haven't done a full commitment. Some communities, well, at least in Central East region, there is a training and restorative process that Central East region staff can come in and do for your congregation. And then you can, you can kind of adapt what you would like to have your community commit to. Um, so it's, it's kind of like um, people are testing out how to fit it into their congregational system still. We're not there yet for sure, but we're introducing it more when we have any offerings related to racial justice so that we're not doing more harm by bringing up the racial anxiety between people without having some way of actually holding that. I'd love to see more restorative practices in our UU congregations in general, because one of the things that the, at the collaboratory at the commission meeting that I brought up in our small group um, was that one of, the, one of the heartbreaking patterns that I see in UU congregations is this, you know, a con and a chicken or the egg, a congregation gets hurt by a minister and then they, they put their guard up and then they hurt the next minister. And so the minister has their guard up for the, and then it's just this never ending cycle. Then you add trying to make anything diverse and you add microaggressions and we, we, we kind of, there's this almost an annihilation thing that happens with us that is so heartbreaking because it does, it's not, there's nothing spiritual about that. Um, and, and working through things is the harder thing is the, and it's also the most spiritual and, the, and what works our muscle, our spiritual muscles of resilience that POC have more than folks who aren't from marginalized, have marginalized identities. And so, um, I appreciate the, the framing Sheila that doing both together will, will help create a framework for how because that's one of the things too is I feel like sometimes white people well we can't you know when you talk about microaggressions well we can't say anything well that's not the point and then the, and this was a tool like no actually you can and then when this happens here's how to repair the relationship and I think it's a beautiful model and I hope something that um, instead of another ridiculous governance model if we could pick up restorative practices as a fad and that we keep that would be great am I editorializing 
I'm really excited because I have to write a column on restoration for Quest. That's our next theme. So I'm oh. like, Lewis, you, you're going to be quoted a lot. I'm going to be listening. I'm going to be Asia Hauser. I mean, I feel like making this real in our congregations um, yeah. makes them into learning labs. You know, one of the things you said, Asia, in your in you and Sheila's workshop that is just alive in me is it, that when you apologize, then you follow it up with, how can I make this right? And it's just really stewing in me, but it's it it's that personal, it's that personal restorative accountability that that, you know, it's just saying I'm sorry. Um it, it, it's step one of, of accountability and humility and I'm in it. Um, but the idea of what, then what's the next step and how do we not, you know, all the stuff about restoration that, that we get mad at somebody and, or, or, or we know that we blew it and how do we get back? How do we get back into relationship? And, um, you know, I, I, I we demonize, uh, we demonize, religious professionals who screw up and uh we oust them and how do how do we how do people find their way back and how do we invite them back um one of the challenges for Lareda right now you know we have we we don't have an in good standing we don't really have a a a, a in anything in our bylaws and our policies that says you know, what, are, how do you be in good standing? And now that we have delegate status, woohoo! Um, you know, how does somebody lose being in good standing with Lareda? Well, we have professional practices, code of ethics, code of, you know, if you, if you really, if you really blow it, then we've got to take your membership away. We've got to take your, I, you know, that we, we are, have just started kind of developing that. And, then and and as we do that, then how do people get back in good standing? How do they how do they rec, how do we reconcile and and that it that that it's the white supremacist stuff to kick people out to say you blew it get out you're 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 not loved anymore, um, and it it you know it's the it's the people of color we and love and and community that um, is about how do we restore how do we be restored ourselves and how do we invite people back into community um, with love? Right. Right. And you're, you're, you're an example of that, Annie, like having gone through a fall con, we didn't all vote to oust you or to uh, oust the board. Right. We didn't do it. And I'm really proud of that. Like I'm proud that the Lareda folks stayed in it together because we could have very well said, you know, that's you right. have made this decision with warning beforehand and you're done, but that's, right. that's not the that's way right. it went down. So you set the example for the next president, whoever that is, especially if it's a person of color, right? to be able to say, you know, like, this is what we did and we'll move forward. Yeah. You know, the other thing, Sheila, that, that I was thinking about was how, I mean, we didn't know whether anybody was going to come to fall conference this year, right? And it was lower. It was it was one of our lower years, but I, I, I mean, you know, we wondered when any people of color come, right? Other than the ones who were in leadership and were speaking and all that. And um, I must say, it was very clear this year that white people had done a bunch of work. White religious educators had done a bunch of work this year that the 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 response people had to caucusing and having caucus groups I'll, I'll speak for for white people that i saw i was in a white caucus group um they were there and ready to go and um that was really heartening to me that people went away and did work during the year they didn't just go away going well what you know grumble or whatever but they were ready to come back and reinvest and learn um and you know, the people of color went off, and rumor has it did all sorts of wonderful things together, which seems to be the norm. Yeah. I think the I thank you, Annie, and and yes, I think modeling um, 
Because I, I what I so what part of what drives me is how you, Unitarian Universalism can plant seeds all over the country, and if we could learn restorative practices in a substantive way, that is hard, because you know I think it would affect impact mass incarceration and prison reform, and because that's the part where it impacts. It, it, to me, it feels like this isn't about me or about the one congregation I serve. Or, it, it's in addition to, it's about all those things. But I feel like we're, we're what, 1,100? And granted, some of our congregations are 30 people, but we're a mighty bunch when we put our mind to it. And wouldn't it be great if part of the seeds that we're planting across the nation is um, how to be restorative and impact that further? So that's part of what drives me. That sounds like a great next UU white supremacy teach-in. It does because it's so connected to our theology, right? I mean, this is so deeply grounded in universalism particularly um, because really it's, it's Calvinism at work that says, throw those people away. You know, some people are safe, some people are damned, they're damned. You know, that, I mean, it's just a new version of it. Well, as usual, I'm completely inspired by y'all. <laughs> It's really, uh, I, we just, I'm, I'm delighted every week that two of our panelists are religious educators, Aisha and Christina, because I think that the frame that of wanting to develop your faith as the center of life is just so compelling. And um, so anyway, so that's always good. Sheila and Annie, you've brought in uh, such wisdom and um, commitment and all inness. So Annie, you got something you wanna say? Yeah, I just wanted to say on the on the universalism note that's 250th anniversary of of Murray of Port Murray sermon next year. Lorena Fall Conference is in Baltimore, and uh, we're talking about having like an add-on day so that people who particularly aren't from the East Coast can go see Murray Grove and uh, the the replica of of uh, of the chapel. And um, it will be November, where the fall conference will be November, uh, something like six to 11th around in there. I know, I know. Details, details. Um, but anyway, it, universalism will definitely have a role in, in the fall conference next year. That's great. That's great. Sheila, you got any last words? Oh, as I, uh, I think I listed in my conference uh, this weekend was, you know, um, if you want to go quickly, go by yourself. But if you want to go far, go together. Yeah, I was thinking Aisha's book on collaborative leadership. You know, I think collaboration really is the antidote to perfectionism. Uh, really, I mean, I, yeah, so. Amen. Amen, Sheila. Well, next week we will not have a show. We'll be taking the week off to do whatever we do. Um, Indigenous Peoples Day, Thanksgiving, whatever it is for you. May you have a good week. The week after that, we'll be back with uh, drum leadership, talking about what's new at drum. And um, I hope everybody has a great week off. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody.